watching you two. Two cut-ups in the front row here. It's my mother-in-law. Let the buckets get by. How's everybody doing? Yeah? Go ahead. Give, give Jesus a hand here. Good stuff. This is the uh, last message in our Summer at Life Coast series. Uh, lots of you will be going back to school this week. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, we've talked about uh, working and reward. We kind of work for the weekend, right? We, we get a job. We work for the reward, what, what we can get for it. And we've talked about uh, heading to the mountains. We've talked about mountains and how often Jesus went to the mountains to pray and those mountaintop experiences that just remind us of prayer. You can see better, the air's a little clearer, and you get a different perspective on life. So uh, heading to the mountains is, is very symbolic of prayer time. And uh, we talked about the beach. Uh, going to the beach. When you go to the beach, you bring everything, right? You, you, you pack up everything. You, you roll down there with uh, sandwiches and chips and suntan lotion and towels and, and all kinds of things because you never know who's going to need something. And that was the week we had our 4th of July outreach. We used all our resources so we would make sure that everyone on the beach had what they needed. And we gave out over 600 hot dogs and, I don't know, 800 waters and freeze pops and suntan lotion and just everything we could do just in order to gain favor, the favor of all the people as the Bible says they shared their resources with them, with the people and they gained favor. We talked about family and maybe family reunions and what it, how great it is to have a uh, family reunion every single Sunday. The church family comes together. I mean, we have family reunions that we go to in the summer, but we, we uh, don't realize that 52 times a year we can have a family reunion right here. Can I get a good amen on that? Got a fam great family of Life Coast family right here. And so, and then uh, we talked also about a working vacation that sometimes you feel like you're, you're off, but you got to bring your job with you so you can pay the bills still or pay for the vacation. And, and sometimes God works that way, right? We feel like we've taken a breather, but something happens in either our life or the lives of our loved ones, and we have to be a spiritual guide for them. We have to be in prayer for them. We have to give good, godly counsel. And, and so even though maybe we feel like we shouldn't be working, it's a working vacation, and we always should kind of view life that way. Pastor Brian talked about a block party and how we make intentional relationships with people outside of the body of Christ. And why do we make intentional relationships? We make intentional relationships in order to have opportunities to share the love of Christ. And that's what we do. That's what the body of Christ does. That's what Jesus commanded us to do, right? Make disciples. And so we make relationships outside the body of Christ all the time, just about every day, doesn't matter who you see, but is it intentional? Does it have a focus on looking for opportunities to share Jesus, to share his love? And last week, Pastor Josh talked about time off in that season of rest, and that we all do need rest, but what we often don't realize is that we seek physical rest all too often and we don't seek true spiritual rest, which is only really found in Christ, in our purpose in life. When we can discover our purpose in life, when we can discover a relationship with Jesus Christ, we truly find the rest that we always seek. So this series is all about looking for the spiritual in everything. Looking for the spiritual in everything. Colossians 1.16 says, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. So when God was creating everything, 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 the seasons, the sun, when he created purpose for us, when he was creating everything, it all was pointing back to him. Because it was created through him and for him. Everything was made through him and for him. And you know, as he created everything, Romans 1.20 says that his divine nature can be seen in all of it. 
He created it so you could see him in all of his creation. And it doesn't matter what the creation is. You can see Christ in his entire creation. Romans 1.20 says that his divine nature, his power can be seen. So no one, no person has an excuse for not seeking out God because his divine nature can be seen just in creation. And finally, Jesus told us that we must worship in spirit and in truth. That he's created all things and we have a physical world that we see everything in. But the reality is is that everything really points to a spiritual truth. Everything created, everything we deal with in life, every physical occurrence, every physical reality, every physical truth is always pointing to a spiritual truth, a spiritual point, a spiritual reality, and a spiritual relationship with a spiritual God. Because we must worship in spirit and in truth. If we haven't discovered that, we are falling short of our relationship with Jesus Christ and with God the Father. If we're truly going to worship God... We need to start looking at everything around us as spiritual. Everything. Everything. Every interaction. Every friend. Every relationship. Every job. Every season. Every opportunity. There's a spiritual reality going on there. And we need to start looking for it. Because that's what we're here for. That's why we're created. Created through him and for him, each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this series. I've so enjoyed just walking through your spiritual truths and who you are and how you've created things. Just make me press in more in everything that I do. Everything that I see makes me look for you even deeper even more fully. I ask this morning that we just grab on to that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I get started on, on today's message, I just wanted to say uh, happy birthday to my girl, Sydney. Where is she? She's over there. 18 years old today. Tear. 18. Unbelievable. And uh, I also wanted to thank my son Alex. He's uh, been going to school to, uh, for pastoral studies in Birmingham, Alabama. I just like saying it that way. And, um, and he interned with us this summer. And this is his last Sunday with us. But he's been just a huge help. He could have gone anywhere. He could have stayed there. He could have gone to a lot of different places, done a lot of different things. But he chose to come back here. He felt like God wanted him to help here at Life Coast. So why don't you give him a big hand for coming and help us out this summer. Love you, buddy. See, when, we, when we're traveling, when we're uh, taking our summer travels, our summer vacations, sometimes it's a road trip for a day, sometimes it's a road trip for a weekend, sometimes we take multiple weeks, or sometimes, you know, if you're part of the rich and famous, you go for months. You go for the whole, whole season. But at some point, at some point, Whether you're traveling for a day or a month, it's time to head home, isn't it? It's time to head home. We 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 go do everything that we can do, right? I've seen all the sights. I've seen everything I can see. I've traveled across this nation. I've seen the largest gun ever made. I've seen the third largest ball of twine. I've, I've seen everything I can possibly see. I've seen all the sights. And so now I'm going to go visit all the people that I pass by because I have relatives here and here and here so I stop and I go into this house and I go to this house and 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 you know it, you know what they say about company it's it's like fish after 2 days it's, it needs to go so uh it, it's it's you just you, you, you we we see all the sights we see all the people 
And then we do all the experiences, right? If you, sometimes we, some people like roller coasters, right? Or they got to travel to go to a concert or something. Or they, they just have to have this, this entertainment. They experience all the entertainment they can experience. They go to theme parks and go on all the rides and they're going really fast. My family hates me at theme parks because you know what's the most important thing? The next ride. I gotta gotta get there. Okay, let's go. We're off this ride. We're going. We're going to the next one. And they're like, slow down, Dad. You're walking too fast. I gotta get to the next ride. We gotta have the next experience. The, the vacation is only as good as the next experience, right? We're chasing after the next experience. And then, of course, what sets in is we I have felt. The fatigue. I think Pastor Josh touched on this last week. We go around and we, we do everything on our vacation and we're tired. We, we come back from our vacation and we're tired. We're fatigued. We're worn out. We've seen so many things, experienced so much. We're in sensory overload and we're like, that was a great vacation. I need a nap or another vacation. And all too often, at the end of the vacation, we also have broke the bank, right? We may have budgeted X amount of money for our vacation, and there's none left. Or we've actually spent more than we budgeted just because, well, we're on vacation. It's okay. We'll, we'll spend a little more. I'll work some overtime or whatever. I remember Stacy and I came back from our honeymoon. This was before the days of you know, ATMs and all of that. And we hopped on the plane to come home and we literally had change in our pockets from what the money we budgeted. We, we were afraid that if I took the wrong road from the airport to home, we wouldn't have enough to pay a toll if we happened to go through one. We spent it all. We come back with breaking the bank. See, but even in this... Even in this, there's a spiritual connection. There's a spiritual connection to all of these things. See, because we're chasing after those sights. We're, we're chasing after the experiences. We're, we're moving so fast that we get tired. And, and we get emotionally drained. See, because what the Bible says is that the sights cannot compare to what Jesus has in store for us. See, but we still chase after all of these things. We, we, try, to, we try to grab onto new sights, see new things, because we're never satisfied with this world. And guess what? You're not supposed to be satisfied in this world. That's why you keep chasing after something more. You want to see something better. 1 Corinthians 2.5 says this, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. See, we're chasing after worldly sights. We're chasing after natural sights. But what we don't realize is, is that what's left of this world is ruin. Because God created it all good at the beginning, and then he destroyed it with a worldwide flood. And what we have is what's left over after the wrath of God has washed over the whole place. And we think this is amazing. You're starting to understand that no eye has seen. I don't care what man-made ride has been conceived of. I don't care what virtual reality that you've been a part of. No one has even begun to think what God has in store for us. The sights that we are going to see when he restores his church to fellowship with the Father are beyond what we can possibly think. No sight can compare with what's coming. But our heart longs for it. And we're chasing after pale comparisons. Why do we do that? The entertainment will never satisfy. We think if we do the next ride, 
We think if we have the next drink, we think if we pour the next concoction into ourselves, if we eat the best food, if we try the best experience that we can possibly experience, that then life will be full. It'll be amazing. But the problem is, it's created to point to Jesus. So it, it's never going to satisfy. It's, go, it's designed for us to always want more. Because the only one who satisfies is Jesus Christ. It's designed that way. You're designed that way. I'm designed that way. That nothing in this world will satisfy the hunger and the desires that we have. It's never going to satisfy. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with that income. This, too, is meaningless. This is Solomon wrote this. The wisest man on earth. He had it all. In his day and age, he had it all. And he said it's meaningless. It's meaningless. He figured it out. He figured it out that I can get as much money as I possibly can get. It's not going to be enough. I can do all the experiences that are here on this earth. I can spend millions doing it all. And I'm not going to be satisfied. The fatigue is even spiritual. That we can't even begin to fathom why we're tired. Because we're chasing after the wrong thing. Pastor Josh touched on this last week. We keep chasing after something that fulfills. And it's never going to get us anywhere. It's never going to give us the rest that we want, that we need. And so we'll continue to get tired. We'll continue to feel the fatigue of this life. Because we're chasing after futility. It's designed that way. God created it that way. That we have a God-shaped hole. Many of you have all heard this before. We got a hole in our being, in our soul, in our spirit. We have this hole. And it's shaped just like Jesus. And nothing fills it. Nothing it, we're created that way. You're never going to feel purpose and whole and rest. You're never going to be at rest until you fill that hole in your life with Jesus Christ. It's never going to happen. Our bank becomes empty. Our bank becomes empty. Our spiritual bank we got, we got nothing to spend. I got no more to give. I'm spiritually spent. I had this correction officer I used to work with. His name was Tommy. He was so funny. He always walked around kind of mopey. And he was a rough Irishman. You could tell he'd been in about 112 fights and he won three. <laughs> he, he was beat up. And I always ask him, how you doing, Tommy? I'm emotionally, spiritually, and financially a wreck. That's, he'd give me that answer every single time. Emotionally, spiritually, and a financial wreck. That's what I am. I was, but he epitomized. I told you I wasn't going to tell a prison story. I told one, didn't I? That just came into my head. So I, there you go. So, but he epitomized this bankruptcy. Because he thought there was nothing else left. He'd used it all up. Psalm 94.11 says this. The Lord knows that people's thoughts are morally bankrupt. They're morally bankrupt. What does that mean? It means that if we're trying to do things with our own thinking, our own mind, our own thoughts, that we have nothing that offers any... Uh, ownership to it, no value. That was the word I was looking for that didn't come out. There's no value to our own thoughts, to our own ways, to our own desires. There's no value to it. It's morally bankrupt. That, that with, in and of ourselves, we're never going to find any value in life. It's always going to seem we're going to feel broke 
spiritually broke. So we have to ask ourselves these questions. The eternal questions that you need to ask yourself. Do I believe that I am a Christian, but I do not truly know God? Do I call myself a Christian, but I don't know God? Because we've come to a day and age in a culture where calling ourselves a Christian means a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. But if we call ourselves a Christian, yet we don't know God, or even if we just say we know God, I believe in God, and I call myself a Christian, is that a true statement? Because James 2.19 says this, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Because you can believe that God exists, you can believe that there is a God, but don't call yourself a Christian just because you believe there's a God. Because even the demons believe that there's a God, and they have fully and completely rejected him. The second question is this, do I believe that Jesus died for my sins? Do I believe that Jesus died for my sins? Because that's the only connection to being a Christian. That do you believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sin, the sin that separated you and me from a holy God? Do you believe that Jesus paid our penalty on that cross by dying and taking that separation for us? He paid the penalty. He paid our bill. And he's saying it's right here. The payment is available for you. And then you can call yourself a Christian. When you say, Jesus, I receive what you've done for me on the cross. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead, conquering sin and death on my behalf. I believe that. I am now a Christian because of believing that very thing. Just believing in God doesn't make you a Christian. And here's the last question. Do I want to face eternity without Jesus? Do I want to face eternity without Jesus? Because whether you believe it or not, there's a judgment day coming. Whether you believe that or not, I believe with all my heart, when the Bible tells us that there's a judgment day coming, it's true. And, and you can choose not to believe that, but when you're standing there before a holy God, and he says, what did you do with Jesus? And you can say, oh, I thought I'd try this out on my own. I thought I would stand here and say, my good outweighs my bad. And that should be enough. The problem is that God's standard is perfection. The standard is perfection. And so if you're standing there with any bad, you've lost. Because the only thing that pays the penalty, the only thing that fulfills the law, the only thing that justifies you and me before a holy God is if our sins get paid for. Either we pay for them or Jesus pays for them. So if you're going to stand, go into eternity without Jesus, you're saying, my goodness is good enough. So here's the real issue. See, at the end of every, all our travels, at the end of everything, it's time to come home. It doesn't matter how far you go. It doesn't matter how far you travel away. You can go 10 miles. You can go 20 miles. You can go 1,200 miles. You can go 3,000 miles. But at some point, it's time to come home. And that requires that we turn around and head in a different direction when it's time to come home. Here's the problem. Here's the problem in, in our churches today all over this country is that Jesus said, follow me. And what so many Christians are actually doing is saying, well, Jesus, why don't you follow me? 
See, because Jesus spoke, he said, follow me. And we should have turned and gone and followed him. We should have changed the direction of everything we were doing and followed him. The problem is, is we're going in our own direction. We're walking, and Jesus says, follow me. And I would say, oh, Jesus, I believe in you. I'm going this way. Why don't you tag along with all my ideas, my concepts, my decisions, what I want to do in life, so I have an insurance policy, so you're right here. So, Jesus, you follow me, and I'm going to keep doing life the way I I want to do it. That's what a lot of the church is doing today. But that isn't what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, follow me. He said, follow me. Which means that we turn and go in the other direction. The Bible calls that repenting. That's all it means, is to turn and go in the other direction. If you were doing things this way and you want to follow Jesus, you start doing them this way. If your relationships are going lousy the way you're doing them, and you're not doing them the way Jesus says to do them in the Bible, turn, start doing them that way. If your job is going terrible, you, you, you hate when you go to work, start doing it God's way. What does God say about how we work, our attitudes, our actions? If we're struggling with finances, with anything in life, relationships, marriages, how are you doing it? Are you doing it the way Jesus said to do it? If you're not, you're not following him. You're doing it your way and expecting him to jump in and rescue you when we mess it all up. And you know what? We will mess it up. Because when we do things the world's way, it's inevitably destined for failure in one way or another. Heading home begins when we change direction. We have to change direction in order to head home. Now you might be a believer in here and, and you may know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but there's certain areas of your life that you're still doing things your own way. You're still saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep going this way because this is how I decided to do it and I'm going to carry this out. But it directly goes against what the Word of God says. It's directly against it. And you keep doing it. And it keeps turning up bad. That definition of insanity keeps popping up, right? I keep doing things the same way, expecting different results. But if you're doing them your way and they continue to fail, it's because it's not God's way. It's because he has a way. He has a plan for you. He wants you to follow him in every aspect of your life. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what area of life it is. There's a principle within the word of God that shows us how we are supposed to do this. Are we in a relationship that's failing? Are we being forgiving and have we forgiven? Or is that relationship just going to hang there the way it is? Are we working in a job that's not working out for us? Are we doing it with honor and respect? Are we giving our best at every level of that job? Are we honoring our boss, our customers? Are we honoring them? Or are we doing it our way because uh, they don't respect me, so I don't respect them? That's not God's way. God's way says honor anyway. You're getting dishonored, honor anyway. That's when God blesses. When we do things His way. We need to leave the domain of death and enter the land of the living. 1 John 5.12 says this. I know I jumped around on you a little, Tanya. Try to, try to hang with me here. I bopped around. 1 John 5.12. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. See, Jesus is the answer. He's reaching out. He's saying, follow me. I don't care if you never knew Jesus at all this morning or if, or if you've prayed and called on him as your Lord and Savior. If you're not following him in every area of your life, then you're doing a disservice to his word and to, and, and to the Son of God. If you call yourself a Christian, but you're not following God in every area of your life, then you need to start turning around and putting it in his direction. Every single area. Because it's, 
it's time to head home. It's time to head home. I can't implore on you enough that I believe our time is short. And God wants us to impact this community for the kingdom of God. I don't know what God's short is in relation to my short. But I know there's an urgency. There's a spiritual urgency that I keep feeling. That I keep feeling. And I don't know if it's for my generation or the next generation or the next generation. But what I'm telling you is is that I'm going to pour into my generation and the next generation and the next generation because the time is short. I'm going to look at every area of my life and I'm going to turn and head home and follow Jesus in every area. And I would implore you that if you have never turned and followed Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul, that today is the day for you to do that. That there's, there's not enough time for you to say, let me think about it. Because we don't know. The days are short. I got one last verse I want to share with you. Acts 3.19. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, which is awesome. It's an amazing promise. Turn and follow Jesus so your sins may be wiped out. What an amazing promise. But that's not even the best part of this verse. It's not even the best part. That's an amazing part. It's the first step, but listen to the next part. And that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You get that? Do you understand what he's saying? It doesn't matter if you know Jesus already or you don't know Jesus already. He's saying turn and follow him because times of refreshing will follow. If you're feeling low, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling fatigued, if you've seen all the sights, if you've had all the entertainment that you can possibly have, you're feeling fatigued, and you're emotionally, spiritually wrecked, like my buddy Tom. It's time to turn. It's time to repent. Because the answer is right in front of you. I don't believe it's an accident that all of you are here today. Every single person in here has some area of their life that they need to turn and repent. I raise my hand. I have an area. Anybody else have an area that they need to turn and repent? Amen. I don't know where you are in life. I don't know if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I don't know if you're living, if you're in the land of the living with the body of Christ or if you're in the domain of death because if you do not have Jesus, you do not have life. I don't think I can put it any clearer than that. I don't want to go another day on this earth without being intentional about every relationship I come in contact with. I want to listen to the Spirit in every conversation I have. I want to listen to what He's telling me. And what He said to me last night when I should have been sleeping but I'm fully convinced the Holy Spirit is on Jerusalem time. Is that there's, there are so many that need to come home. That need to come home. Their relationships are wearing them out. Their experiences are futile leave them unsatisfied they've been looking for the answers in every site they can possibly find and they're emotionally and spiritually bankrupt and Jesus said I want them to have value I want them to feel fulfilled I want them to have the rest and fulfillment that only I can offer. And so he asked me to ask you, 
would you come home today? Would you come home? Stand with me. We have a prayer team of people coming down on both sides. We have pastors and elders that are going to be down here. And I don't care if you've never known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't care if you've never even thought about it in your life. I'm asking you this morning to come home. I don't know if you've been called on the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but little by little you've found yourself in a place that doesn't honor him in life. You found yourself in a place where that if you said you were a Christian, there'd be no evidence to convict you. Jesus says, come home. Come home. As as the summer ends and your traveling is all done, in life, Let's call this the end of your traveling away from Jesus. And he's standing there and he's saying, welcome home. Welcome home. Now, I'm not going to walk back out here again and and try to coax you or coerce you or or ask you to come down. I'm going to do this one time because I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is far greater than any words that I can utter. He's asking you to come home. So as the worship team sings an anthem, I'm going to ask you to come right down these aisles. Don't wait and see who else is doing it. Because guess what? The family of God is here. When you walk down those aisles, we're going to celebrate because we know that you've come home. That you've come home. Father God, I pray this morning for all those who are going to come home. That they know that they've traveled so far. And they know that they feel distant. They don't feel whole. They feel tired and bankrupt. God, you're a loving and forgiving Father and your Son died on the cross so that we could come home. Lord Jesus, I pray for these people who desire to come home. If it's calling on the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior for the first time, believing that he died on the cross for their sins, praying that, uttering that with their mouths, believing in their heart that God raised them from the dead, pray that. honor and the glory because it's only through your spirit that we can come home it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that our penalty can be paid it's only through your word that we can know the better way to do life and to follow Jesus it's his name we pray